Victoria, I just want to give you a very brief overview of what the Carnegie is. So Carnegie Science is a group of six departments to study fundamental science. Uh, we were basically initiated over a hundred years ago by Andrew Carnegie, who felt that there needed advancing technology advancing a nation. And so he created the Carnegie Institution of Washington. And we were actually I wish my, my librarian uh, historian was here. I would say the Geophysical Laboratory was initiated in uh, basically 1905, and they were challenged to do something that, that had not been done at all at that time, which was to basically try to understand the formation and evolution of this planet from fundamental physics and chemistry. And this is something we continue to do to this day. So that's our background. Um, I like to say, you know, we work on impractical problems, um, but we work on very fundamental problems that relate to our existence on this planet, why we're here, why this planet's here, and all of these things. Um, so now on to uh, our speaker tonight. Our speaker tonight is, is Robert Hazen. And Robert Hazen got his bachelor's degree at MIT. And then he went on to Harvard, just, just up the road to Harvard. And he got his PhD at Harvard. And uh, after his PhD at Harvard, he came straight to the Geophysical Laboratory. I think first as a postdoctoral fellow, and, and as often as the case, um, then transition to a, a, a staff member. Because we, we typically hire young scientists as staff members and then watch them develop their careers. And so Bob Hazen has developed an amazing career uh, at the Geophysical Laboratory. And I'm not going to tell you how many years it is. Um, but he's, Thank he's, you. <laughs> but, but he's, and he's still developing his career, so we don't see an end to it for quite a while. Uh, but, but it's really been spectacular. He's moved all over to so many different fields, um, and, and all of which I think thematically linked to his love of mineralogy and his interest in mineralogy, which is a, a core field in the earth sciences. Um, but he's expanded or origins, basically mineralogy to origins of life, and mineralogy into origins of so many different things. And tonight he's talking about really a new development that he's just started working with a bunch of different people in sort of this big picture idea about what mineralogy is basically a language uh, that we don't yet understand. It tells us about essentially the origins and subsequent four and a half million years of evolution. So with that, I hand it off to you, Bob. George, thank you. And <laughs> I'm so excited to be here tonight because I want to share with you what has absolutely been for me the most exciting period of my life in mineralogy. We are making some fundamental discoveries and in fact, it happens on a day-to-day -day basis. So what I'm going to do tonight is actually share with you that process of discovery. And with my early career colleagues, we are going to look at diagrams developed from big data, new graphs and charts that no one's ever seen before. And we'll share in figuring out what's going on. So this is part of a wonderful program that has been sponsored by the Keck Foundation. We have six PIs in various fields, Andy Knowles in paleontology, Dmitry Sprigensky at Johns Hopkins in geochemistry, Paul Falkowski is a geobiologist interested in protein structures at Rutgers, Peter Fox, a geoinformatics expert, and boy do we rely on him, Bob Downs, mineralogist at University of Arizona. We also have other colleagues who bring in other specialties from around the world, John Yon Ralph is a database builder in the United Kingdom, Sergei Kravovichev, a crystallographer in St. Petersburg, other people who just bring incredible richness to this. But more than anything, what just thrills me now in is the early career people that we're working with. Every one of them better than the last and all of them no more than, than us old guys. I'll tell you, it is astonishing. Um, from all over the country, many different universities, and particularly tonight, I'm thrilled that Michael Meyer, Chao Liu, Shauna Morrison are here with me and they're going to be helping me in doing this real-time data analysis and doing some of the presentations. So you're going to get to see sort of the thrill, the excitement of what we're all experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. So let me just start with some basics. What's a mineral? So a mineral is something that occurs naturally. You go out, climb around the mountains, you find them on the ground. It has to have a well-defined chemical composition like silicon dioxide, that's the mineral quartz, and it has to have a well-defined crystal structure. So if you have an object that's natural that has a crystal structure and a chemical <coughs> composition within a different range, that's a mineral species. Now, the word rock is familiar to you. What a rock is is nothing more than accumulation of one or more minerals that occurs in a natural setting. So you may have a granite countertop or you may have a piece of basalt or seen this. These are common rocks and they're made of two or more uh, 
minerals typically in this sort of way. And then also an ore deposit. This is another kind of rock, but it's just simply defined economically. An ore deposit is a rock with one or more minerals that can be mined for profit. So actually, what is an ore deposit depends somewhat on the economic state from time to time. Okay, so we're going to look at three different aspects of mineralogy using big data. The first one is called mineral evolution. The second one, mineral ecology. And the third, and this is brand new just in the last few months, mineral network analysis. So what are we trying to do? Why are we studying minerals? Well, there are a number of reasons. We want to understand the diversity and distribution of minerals on our planet. And that helps tell us about the current state and the history of Earth. We want to understand and compare Earth to other planets and moons. The moon, Mars, Mercury, other worlds. We also want to be able to predict, and this is something very new in mineralogy, to predict what's missing. The minerals that have not yet been discovered, but actually say, where do we go? What are we going to find when we get there? And to discover new ore deposits that might be valuable to society. These are all motivations that we have. Tonight I'm going to tell you about three fundamental discoveries that have been made in just the last few years. In fact, a couple of them just in the last year itself. So these all have to do with taking big data resources and studying them in new ways. So first, this idea that Earth's mineralogy has changed through time. Now, that was well known. But what's striking is that most of that change is a consequence of biology. As a young mineralogy student, I was told, don't bother to study biology. You'll never use it. And it turns out that's not quite true. Mineral ecology is a new way of thinking about Earth's distribution of minerals in, in space, over the surface. And what we find there, which is really remarkable, is that almost all of Earth's minerals tend to be relatively rare. The majority, extremely rare. And that tells us something about Earth, and I think it's telling us something about the biosphere as well. And finally, mineral network analysis. It turns out there are ways of analyzing minerals as coexisting species that are remarkably similar to social networks where you analyze people and their interrelationships. So the mathematics that's been used for social networks can be applied to mineral networks. Now, all of these discoveries require big data sets. There are two of them that we take advantage of. One of them is called rough.info. It has all the known mineral species in a list. It has chemical selectors. You can look at the minerals of just one chemical element. It also has a new section that we've developed over the last few years, especially thanks to Josh Golden and Alex Pyers at the University of Arizona. And then we also take advantage of the crowdsourced database called mindat.org. Hundreds of amateur collectors, many of them very serious and, and, and extremely well informed about mineralogy, go around the world. They have now defined minerals that occur at over 275,000 localities. So this vast data resource is available to us. And I'm going to ask Shauna Morrison to show us some of the details of how we mine these data. So Shauna is a graduate student just finishing up her PhD now at the University of Arizona. And I'm thrilled that she's going to be joining me as a postdoc in February. So, Thank you, Bob. Uh, so I'd like to start by showing you the rough.info uh, website. Uh, so this is the official list of minerals for any of you that are interested. And there are a lot of things we can do here. Um, but the first thing I'd like to point out is that there are 5,180 known mineral species on Earth today. That number is um, updated on a very regular basis. And um, there are a, a bunch of things we can look at. But as Bob mentioned, we can do a chemical search. So I'd like to start there. Uh, so if we select an element, uh, say lithium, you see that this number has changed. Now there are 114 minerals that contain lithium as an essential element. Uh, let's add something else. So let's add in, uh, say, potassium. So there are 28 minerals known on Earth that contain lithium and potassium. And so we can explore further from here. We can pick a mineral from the list, say, neptunite. And uh, we have a lot of different buttons. We could come over here and we could look at the evolution page, which I'm going to show you in a moment. Um, or we could go to Mindat, uh, which has a lot of really great information on minerals. Uh, so you'll see we've got a lot of gorgeous images here and a lot of crystallographic information. Uh, it's got some great uh, references. 
if you're interested in some papers on these minerals. And uh, probably most importantly for our purposes, we have a map here that shows the distribution of these, uh, the, this particular mineral, neptunite, uh, on the Earth's surface. Uh, furthermore, if we select a particular locality, so this is Woods Reef Mine in Australia, we can look at a mineral list here. So these are all the minerals that occur at this particular locality. So we're able to see what minerals coexist with Neptunite. And so if you want to keep exploring from here, you can say, oh, well, this, this mineral kind of strikes my fancy, so I'm going to go look at this. And you can see the images and you can explore from there. So just one more thing I wanted to show you on the Rough website, and that's our evolution database. Um, with the evolution database, now we're going to look at uh, information for all of the minerals uh, that have lithium and potassium. These numbers that you're seeing here are age data. Okay, So these are localities, places on the planet, where we have dated minerals. So we're able to know how old these minerals are. And um, this is what we use. Uh, and you see we have a map pretty similar to what we have on Mindat. And this is what we use for the mineral evolution studies. And uh, Bob's going to talk to you uh, more about that now. Fantastic. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, so one of the things you saw here is it's very important for us to think about chemistry when we talk about minerals. And in tonight's talk, I'm going to be focusing on some of the recent work we've been doing on what are called the first row transition elements. These are nine elements. They include titanium, vanadium, chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, and zinc. And these are interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, they're relatively abundant in Earth's crust. So there are a lot of minerals for each of them. Second thing is their chemical behavior is very sensitive to the presence of oxygen. And this means that there's a connection between these minerals and life and photosynthesis. So as photosynthesis emerges on Earth, these minerals become more complex. And indeed, they also play very important roles in some cases in biology. So we're fascinated by this connection between the geosphere and the biosphere. Now, there are a lot of other elements that are important in minerals. Here's a subset in the periodic table. And one of the things I want to do tonight is actually explore mineral evolution, mineral ecology networks for elements that we've never looked at. And so what I'd like is if you give us the name of some elements. And Chow Liu is back here. He's sitting at the computer. He's going to be analyzing this. So, <laughs> Hi, Chow. Hi, <laughs> so, so give me some names of chemical elements. Antimony. Vanadium. Vanadium. Neptunium. Boron. Boron. Neptunium. 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 Gold. Gold. <laughs> Uranium. Lead. Tin. Tin. Tantalum. Okay, tantalum. Those are all great choices. So, so we're kind of overwhelming chow here. <laughs> but that's fantastic. Okay, so stay tuned. When we come back, maybe he'll have some of the mineral evolution diagrams for these elements, and I guarantee we have not looked at those yet, so this will be discovery for all of us. Now, mineral evolution, a focus on changes through Earth history of Earth, Earth's near-surface mineralogy, and there are effects that relate to physics, to chemistry, and to biology. Now, the idea is we're looking at changes over time in the diversity of species, that it's just how many minerals there are, but also the relative abundance of those minerals. Their compositions, because the trace and the minor elements shift through time. And even the sizes and shapes, something that mineralogists have always been aware of, but we've never really studied them systematically. So these are all ways we think about minerals. I have to make a disclaimer. A lot of people have criticized this. Some of my biology friends have said, well, why do you call this evolution, you know, life evolves, but minerals don't evolve. But minerals as a system do evolve. And it is something that's commonly used in geology. Norman Bowen, who you'll hear about a little bit more later, talked about the evolution of the igneous rocks a century ago. We also imply that there's a complexification and increase in diversity and distribution of these minerals through time. And there's a logical sequence, congruency, where you have primitive stages that become more and more evolved as time goes on. So there is a sequence. It's not just random. But we're not talking about Darwinian evolution. <laughs> Erase this from your mind. This is not what... <laughs> <laughs> 
Exactly. So, so, okay. So the idea of mineral evolution is that new minerals arise through chemical, through physical, and also surprisingly biological processes. That's one of the really amazing things. So to give you a sense of mineral evolution, some of you may have heard this, but but this is a fun. No one that I can find before we talked about mineral evolution had ever asked the question, what was the very first mineral in the cosmos? So I ask you to think about that. Now you know that a mineral has a chemical composition and it's got a crystal structure. So it's it's a solid, it's a condensed solid. Or not oxygen. <laughs> yeah. So so think about this. You're, you're calling out some elements. It's interesting, but think about the Big Bang, 13.8 billion years ago. After the Big Bang, there was some hydrogen, there was some helium, maybe a little bit of lithium, but nothing that would form crystals, and it was still much too hot. And so you, you can't form any crystals before you then, you have to form the first stars. And a star is much too hot. There's not gonna be any crystals in the star, but stars evolve, they go through nuclear fusion reactions. You go from hydrogen and helium to carbon, and you move up the periodic table, and then, what happens? Supernovas. Supernovas. Okay, so this is a hint. So what would be the first crystal that would form? So you have an envelope of gas, it's expanding, it's cooling, it's cooling, it's cooling. What's going to come out first? Iron oxide. Interesting guess. Yeah, it certainly is high temperature. The answer is diamond. Diamond, because carbon is one of the most abundant elements in the envelope as it explodes, and it also has a very high temperature condensation, so it condenses out before anything else, and that's the key. Um, and then there's a whole other series which we call the Ur minerals. The next thing that comes out is graphite. As you cool down a little bit farther, graphite comes out, and then another series of, of very sort of strange minerals, about a dozen in all. We call those the Ur minerals. They would be the earliest crystals in the cosmos, the very first minerals. They have about 10 different primary chemical elements in them. And so you could say that the whole question of mineral evolution is how do you go from about a dozen minerals with 10 essential elements to what we see on Earth today, which is more than 5,000 minerals, with 72 essential elements? What is the process? And so let me take you on a quick journey through Earth history to show you how we think about this. We divide Earth history into 10 stages of mineral evolution. The very first stages arise in the solar nebula when the sun has gathered most of the hydrogen and helium. 98% or more of the mass of the solar system is in that early star. It ignites. It sends waves of heat out. Now, farther out from the sun, there's dust. There's gas. And the dust is collected together in little dust bunnies, electrostatic forces. You can just imagine, you know, like in the corner of your room. It's just like that in space. And then the waves of heat blast it, and it all melts down into little tiny droplets called chondrules. And these chondrules form the very first solid materials that are new to our solar system. There are a whole series of meteorites then that have these chondrules that have more advanced stages. We think about 250 different mineral species all in all in stage one and two. And then we form planets. That's stage three. Now planets, the number of minerals depends very much on things like the size of the planet and how wet the planet is. So if you have a small dry world like the moon or Mercury, these tend to be frozen worlds where there's very little new mineralogy going on and we think perhaps 300 mineral species is it for those worlds. If you have a wet world like Mars or early Earth, you can also add things like hydroxides and, and evaporite minerals like sodium chloride, salt. And so this gives you perhaps 400 minerals or so. On Earth, it's large enough that you get additional stages of heat and melting, producing a rock called granite with lots of additional minerals, very rare and exotic minerals in some cases. It takes you up to about 1,000 mineral species. That's stage four. And on Earth, we also have plate tectonics, even more processing of the near surface environment. You get new kinds of volcanism, you get ore deposits, you get high pressure minerals, and that takes you up to 1500. So they're the first five stages, only physics and chemistry. And with physics and chemistry, we argue you can get to maybe 1500 mineral species, and that's it. But on Earth today, we have over 5,000 species. How is that possible? How do we get to this very large number? The answer, it turns out remarkably, 
is life. I think this is wonderful, the realization of how integrated our planet is, how every part feeds back on the other parts. Stage six, the very earliest period when the origin of life occurred. You have single cells that accelerate the production of certain minerals, but they don't actually create any new minerals at this point. They just create large deposits of phosphates and carbonates of iron oxides. And we mine these and we, we value them, but they're not new minerals that would not have occurred otherwise. What really was the game changer was the great oxidation event about two and a half billion years ago. And this is when photosynthesis started generating huge amounts of oxygen. And the near surface environment changed forever and the mineral forming environments changed as well. So what we think about then in terms of Earth's oxygen is before, this is the scale of one billion, two billion, three billion years ago. And about two and a half billion years before that period, oxygen was extremely low. In fact, some of us argue there was no molecular oxygen available whatsoever during that period. So it's what we call very reducing conditions. When photosynthesis began, you got a rise of oxygen, perhaps to 1% or so of current levels. And then in the last half billion years or so, another rise up to modern levels. That's the kind of rough outline. Well, what does this mean if you think then about the partial pressure of oxygen? Some minerals could form early in Earth's history, others not. We think that native copper, and copper in this very reduced state, could have formed quite easily. But copper one plus minerals, and especially copper two plus minerals, all those beautiful blue and green minerals that we see in a museum that, that those of us who are mineralogists love, we think they couldn't have formed before the great oxidation of it. So that means that more than two thirds of all the copper minerals would not have formed before life. And the same thing is true of uranium. 90% of the uranium minerals on Earth today require oxygen to produce the more oxidized form of uranium. The same thing as nickel, and it's true for cobalt, and it's true for manganese, and many, many other elements. So, when I say that the number of mineral species tripled, think about it this way. The vertical scale is the partial pressure of oxygen on a log scale. Before the great oxidation event, you're really restricted to environments that were below about 10 to the minus 60. But as soon as oxygen comes into play, you go all the way up. You triple the range of oxygen partial pressures. And I don't think it's surprising, therefore, that you're tripling the number of minerals. Each of these represents a boundary between different minerals, the two plus, the three plus manganese, the two plus, the three plus iron, and so forth. The higher you go, the more minerals you produce. Okay, that's stage seven. That's the game changer. That's the punctuation event in Earth history. Then we had a long period in which the oceans gradually became more oxygenated, but very little happened mineralogically. That's called the boring billion by some people, the stage eight. <laughs> we had a period of snowball earth events. This is something that Mike Meyer has been studying. And basically here's a period when you had global glaciation. The major mineral on Earth's surface is ice. H2O in a crystalline form that's well defined. That's a mineral. So so that's a very different mineralogical setting. And then finally, what really took us over the edge is the last 500 million years, what's known as the Phanerozoic, the time of complex animal life, the time when plants started to go onto the land. And, and by 400 million or 350 million years ago, this is what Earth looked like different from any time before. There's also all sorts of biomineralization producing carbonates and silicates, phosphates, and other minerals that are unique to the last um, half billion years in the case of this mineral hazonite named for me a form of microbial poop. Uh, the, the former director of the Department of Terrestrial Magnetism, our sister institution here on campus, said hazonite happens. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the mineral data that we have, this, this timeline. We're now, you're going to see several graphs like this. We're looking at Earth history. Today, 500 million, a billion, two billion, three billion, four billion years ago. We're looking now at 60,000 data points laboriously entered into our mineral evolution database by uh, Josh Golden at the University of Arizona. 
And what you see here then are for all the first row transition elements, when those minerals occur, their ages, they're in 50 million year bins. So the first bin over here is from today back 50 million years. It's very tall because there are a lot of ephemeral minerals that only occur in the most recent sediments. As you go back, what you see is a couple of interesting things. One of them is that there's clear episodicity here. In other words, rather than a uniform distribution through time, you find periods when there's very little mineralization and others where there's spikes. And we wonder what could cause that. It turns out that that episodicity is telling us something very important about Earth history. And that has to do with plate tectonics. You may know that as you go back in Earth history, the continents are not where they are today. Continents are constantly moving on the surface due to plate tectonics. And there are periods of Earth's history when the plates all come together. In modern times, like here, the, the continents are pretty far apart. But there are other times in Earth's history, and we'll note, let's see, we're going to be forming the supercontinent of Pangaea. Coming, it's coming, it's coming. All the continents together in this one large landmass, now they're breaking up again. So you see periods when continents come together, and when that happens, when two continents collide, you form huge mountain ranges, you have fluid circulation, you cause minerals to form. This is a rich mineral forming environment. And so the pulses we see correspond to five episodes of supercontinent formation. Now, you'll see the largest peak in this region is right there. That's the supercontinent of Nuna. There's the largest peak here. That's the supercontinent of Kennerland. Rodinia, not so much. It's kind of curious, but there is something there. Here's Panodia, and then the big one, Pangaea. Always see those spikes. So tectonics is one thing that causes new minerals, but there are other things as well. So remember copper, it had these different oxidation states, copper metal, Cu1 plus Cu2 plus. We look now and color those different oxidation states, green being the 2 plus, blue being the 1 plus. We see a much larger ratio of green to blue in recent period than farther back in time. That's a reflection of biology. That's a reflection of the oxygenation. We see the same thing for manganese. Here's manganese 2 plus, 3 plus, 4 plus. Only the most oxidizing conditions gives you manganese 4 plus minerals. And sure enough, the work that Dan Hummer's done, where you show in yellow the manganese 4 plus, a much higher percentage of manganese 4 plus, and indeed 3 plus minerals in recent times than farther back. So these are the kinds of things that we're discovering. We can put all the transition metals together in a diagram like this. We can compare and contrast. There's a vast amount of information contained in a figure of this sort. But that's old news. That was done last month. <laughs> what about the elements you just gave us? So, so Chow is going to help us out here. And, and this will be new for all of us. I've not seen these elements. I've not seen antimony. I've not seen tellurium. OK, there's SB. That's antimony. Um, so this is the code that we use. It's a, it's a Jupyter script. It's a standard thing. This is going to be open access, so anybody can download this in a few months when we get it up and, and running in the way we want it to. Hi, this is uh, antimony. Antimony. OK, what does it look like? Let's see. It here it comes. shows here. OK. I mean, I've never seen antimony before. I mean, so, <laughs> what's happening? Do you have any ideas? Uh, you might say that the peaks are uh, before supercontinental cycles. I think that makes sense because antimony are hydrothermal minerals. Yeah. So before supercontinents, you have a lot of hydrothermal events. Okay, so just it's, so it's a little bit on the early, the leading side of these supercontinent assemblies, yes. which are the bars at top. Um, the other thing I noticed is in recent period. First of all, there was Sorry. a lot of there's a lot of ephemeral antimony minerals, meaning that they form and, and maybe they're, they're water soluble or they're, um, they're very, they erode quickly or something of that sort. And this period of Phanerozoics is a really big uh, jump. Is there any biological reason for that thing? Uh, there antimony? might be if, if you have a, with just the general rise of more, eco, with the general rise of ecosystems, you probably have uh, more niche space for any sort of organism, including an expansion of the extremophiles. And I'm sure that they help 
do so okay. precipitate themselves. Interesting. So what about another element? Is Neptunium. Neptunium. There's, <laughs> there's nothing. There's, there's no data. There's no minerals that contain that element. It's radioactive, but it's a really interesting one to, to try. This is something we we uh, we see this once in a while. But there's no. And so. this is uranium. Uranium. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Look at that huge spike here, and I, I, you know, most of the big uranium deposits, especially in North America, are biologically mediated, and they are associated with things like buried forests and coal that that you have, you have these oxidized fluids that come in and they alter the uranium and they make it mobile and those fluids go deep underground and they hit buried wood and cold measures and that reduces the uranium and it all deposits out. So I think what we're seeing with that diagram, where'd it go? Oh, we moved yeah. on to gold. Oh, we moved on to gold, okay. <laughs> it's good. Sorry. I mean, I've never, again, gold. What's happening with gold? A lot of modern deposits. A lot of modern deposits. Where, where do they? Rodinia does not like gold. Rodinia does definitely does not like gold, but but Kennerland and Nuna does. So, do one more. This is this is really this is fun. You see, they're all a little bit different. They all have their own character. And so try lithium. Lithium. Wow. Okay. There is the supercontinent cycle. <laughs> I mean, that's that is big time. So lithium forms as a concentrated element in minerals with granites and what are called pegmatites. These are very late stage. So when you form continents, you make lots of granites. And I, my guess is what we're seeing here is this granite formation, granite formation, huge one at Pangaea. And you notice in this particular case for lithium, there's not a big spike in the recent times. Lithium minerals tend to be very stable. They form deep underground, not at the surface, so you wouldn't even have time to erode deposits to get a lot of, so that's really interesting. Diff so this is the kind of thing we're doing all the time. We're thinking about this. Thank you for sharing this with us um, and for letting us think out loud. Okay, so that's what we found. And the conclusion is you can see that we see very interesting changes through time of minerals diversity distribution and these changes have to do with physical tech, uh, problems like tectonics, chemical processes like, like the extraction of fluids, and of course biological processes, the rise of oxygen. Now let's talk about mineral ecology, and this is really focusing on the spatial, not the temporal, but the spatial distribution of minerals on Earth. Again, chemical, physical, and biological environments come in. We're going to do the same thing. Um, let's, have, let's have some more elements. Give me some elements. If the one you just call out we didn't do, let's do it. Zirconium. What's that? Zirconium. 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 Zirconium for Calcium. certainly have. Calcium. Yttrium. Yttrium. Okay, yttrium is a rare earth element, so we might, do, we might do all the rare earths and see how that works. Chromium, I heard. Chlorine. Chlorine. <laughs> okay. One more. Plutonium. Plutonium. Okay. Plutonium. Except plutonium, I don't think has any minerals because it's radioactive. It probably did have minerals very early in Earth history because there's one plutonium isotope that has a half life that's long enough you could have formed plutonium oxide, but um, it's all gone. And sadly, it's all disappeared. Okay. So this mineral ecology is based on a statistical analysis of the distribution of minerals at localities. And what we found out working with Greta Heistead, who's a mathematician at Purdue University, is that the distribution of minerals is very similar to the distribution of biomass in an ecosystem or words in a book. Here's what I mean. Look at a redwood forest. You know, 99.9% .9 of the biomass is redwood trees. But the diversity is all these small, rare things, the little flowers and stuff, the, the California yellow slugs and things like that. So there's a very skewed distribution of diversity versus biomass. Same thing with words in a book. Most words are common, a and the. But it turns out, excuse me, most, most words that you find in a book are ones that are frequently seen. But the rare words are what to define the diversity and also the genre of the book. And in some cases, the authorship. So if you do a statistical analysis of the words in a book or 
and thank goodness the NSA has been doing this, um, emails, they have developed all the mathematics that we use. So, so that's been very, very helpful to us. And the distribution looks like this. When you have, on the horizontal scale, the number of localities, the exact number of localities at which a mineral occurs. So gold occurs, say, at 3,792. That would be a point here. And then some minerals occur at only 10 or only 5 or only 1 locality. There's calcite, thousands of localities. Cinnabar, a mercury mineral, thousands of localities. Diamond is actually fairly common, 700 known <coughs> localities for diamond. Bob Downsite, named after my colleague, is three localities on Earth. I'm still only one. <laughs> Mono Lake in California, but it's a, it is a biological mineral, so I'm, I'm sort of happy about that. Um, and here's what it looks like. This is what's called a frequency distribution in which the number of minerals at exactly one locality, over 1,200 species, at exactly two localities, about 600, three localities, 400, and so forth. In black is the actual data from the MINDAT database. In red is our mathematical model, and it's called a large number of rare events model. It's a distribution which recognizes that you have a distribution of things in which most of them are very rare. Indeed, on Earth, more than half of all mineral species are known from five or fewer localities. So you can use these data. This is why this is so incredible. You can use this to do an accumulation curve where you can actually say, here's the first mineral locale we discovered, and that's a new species, and the second one's likely a new species, and the third. But as you discover 50,000 or 100,000 mineral locality pairs, then you're likely to see things go up. We're, so today we're at, uh, when we did this, this was about 650,000 counts. That's mineral locality pairs. And at that point, there were 4,900 known mineral species. We extrapolate out into the future. We predict that there are at least 1,500 minerals to be found that have not yet been described. They exist on Earth. And we can give you lots of details. We can say how many of them are carbon minerals and how many of them are chromium minerals. And we can also say that as we have new techniques where we're describing minerals in new ways, this number can only go up. But I'm pleased to say that as of now, where we've gone from about this point to this point, we're exactly on track of that line. So the extrapolation right now is working extremely well as we discover more mineral locality counts. And we can do this with lots of other elements. These are the extrapolations for some of those first row transition metal copper that Sean has been working on, chromium, chow has been working on that, cobalt, that's been my project, vanadium, chow, nickel is, is under the works too, and so we have these transition metals, and we find that about 20 to 25 percent of these minerals are typically missing, yet to be found, and we're all inspired to go out and find new minerals, so that's a lot of fun. So now, what did we find? A technical issue. See, I, I'm glad this happened because you can't possibly think that this is as easy as I'm making it sound. <laughs> I mean, if we've had um, a lot of these developments were made as recently as June of this year. We had a three-day hackathon at RPI with all the, the data science people, the, uh, the geoinformatics people there. And so many of the types of things we're trying to do here were initiated then, and we've all been working feverishly since last June. So you get a sense of how this works. So what we basically want to show here is trying to see if the distribution for the elements that you called out conform to this idea of a large number of rare event distribution, where the number of minerals at exactly one locality is, is much larger than at two or three or four. And we I'm see that. I'm sorry for that. Oh, no, no problem at all. This is... This is zirconium. This is zirconium. It, it wouldn't have been... A, honest talk if you didn't have a little bit of it. Okay, so, so here's zirconium. It's not a particularly common element. It doesn't have a huge number of minerals. So at exactly one locality, it looks like there's 41 or 42. At exactly two localities, there's maybe 18. And then there's more scattered in the data because it's not a large number. 
of, of mm -hmm. specific counts. But still, that's very much the spirit of a large number of rare event distribution. So what's one of the other elements? Calcium. Calcium, okay. Uh, here you see a large, a much larger number of data, many, many more calcium minerals, and so we're seeing a much uh, smoother distribution. And we can model this and we can predict and we can tell you with, with the mathematics how many calcium minerals have been, are missing. Now none of us have ever looked at calcium before, I tell you, so this, so this is new to me. And what's this? Yeah. Yttrium. Yttrium. Okay, so this is one of the rare earth elements. Again, not as common, but that's pretty neat. And, and you've seen each of the cases so far, even though the data is scattered, there are a lot more minerals at one locality than at two, and more at two than at three. And what's that? Chlorine. Chlorine. Okay, so that you get the idea. I mean, it turns out, at least so far, every element we've looked at conforms to this LNRE model. Now, if we did the same thing for minerals on the moon or on Mars, so far it would not fit this kind of distribution. So that's, that's kind of interesting. Does that just mean we haven't looked long enough at those other worlds? Or is there something fundamentally different? And also we have uh, plutonium is an uh, error. There's oh. no mineral Oh, oh there's no, no plutonium, so, so you get an error. And, and that's good to know, too. Fantastic. Thank you, Cho. OK. There we go. So the conclusions of mineral ecology, I think you can see that we can employ these data to certainly predict new minerals and understand something about their distribution on Earth. It turns out for some of these minerals, um, for example, minerals of the element sodium, as many as 50% of those minerals have yet to be found. That's because sodium is sort of white and pasty. It's water soluble in a lot of its minerals. They're just sort of bland. No collector would collect them, as opposed to you know, beautiful vanadium or, or uranium minerals. And one of the most interesting things that we're exploring is the idea that this LNRE distribution, which appears to be unique to Earth, may in fact itself be a biosignature. So that's a fascinating idea. We're exploring it. We don't know yet, but it's one of those things. Stay tuned. If we, if we can prove that, then we've got a really interesting result. All right, let's talk about network analysis. And to me, this is something, this has only been the last few months that we've begin to do, begun to do this. It is, I think, the most fun thing I've ever done in my career as a mineralogist. And I think the potential for discovery here is unbelievably vast. So you're just going to get the first sense. Social network analysis is used to model how people interact. And it turns out you can use the same formalisms to look at mineral distributions. OK, once more, elements. Because we're going to, this is, what's mercury? I love it. Mercury. Chow? Silver. Silver, these are great, okay. Arsenic. Okay, mercury, we got mercury, we got silver, we've got arsenic. Iron. Iron. Carbon, okay, that's, that's probably, that's probably not, because these are hard. It turns out that depending on the number of minerals of the element, the computation time is really quite large. So if we have roughly 100 minerals, we can do it in real time. If it's 1,000 minerals, as it would be for iron, then what we probably have to do is do iron plus some other element or iron minus some elements. So we look at a subset. But we'll see what happens. Chow's on the case. OK. Here's a social network. And what you see in a social network, each of these points represents an individual person. This is the spread of a viral disease. So you see, bang, that's where it started, infecting a lot of people, infecting nodes. They traveled to other places. You see other nodes. That's the kind of thing that the CDC does all the time. Very, very important. Here's another kind of network, a terrorist network of Al-Qaeda. You probably can't see it, but there's photographs at every node. They're actually real people, and they're connected by certain leaders. This is something we'll talk about centrality and the importance of certain individuals in a network as opposed to a very highly interconnected network. That's one of the things we can do. And here's something maybe more familiar to some of us, a research collaboration network, where you see a group of researchers that work together, publish papers together. There's some central players. There's some peripheral players. It's the kind of network you can all imagine. Well, it turns out you can do the same thing with scientific subjects. And maybe the most logical step from this is to paleobiology. So, uh, Mike Meyer is going to tell you about some social networks or paleo networks that he's been working on, and that'll logically tie in then to the mineralogy. So, take it away, Mike.
Hello, everyone. So as the, uh, the, the group's uh, resident uh, paleontologist, I, of course, have to start off with some dinosaurs. So uh, here we have a uh, network uh, of uh, common, uh, everyone basically under the auspices of Dinosauria. And um, thank you. So, so this is, there we go. So this is Dinosauria. Um, and, you know, Bob's been talking about how some of this stuff is really new. Well, the, the charts I'm going to show you today are less than eight hours old. Um, so, so hence, they look a little less polished than some of the ones you're going to see later. So um, we're looking at co-occurrences of everyone under the Dinosauria label. So uh, there's actually four different major groups of this. So there's our classic reptiles, as you might, might know, with lizards and turtles and crocodiles. Um, of course, the birds are under these, so our Aves group. Um, and then, and everything else you might traditionally consider a dinosaur. Um, so your theropods, your sauropods, ankylosaurs, triceratops, all those good guys. Um, now, with this network analysis, you notice that, the, that there is a big main chunk of network, but actually a lot of smaller sort of satellite networks, part of the, the polishing that needs to be done. But you can see that, um, the birds are sort of off to themselves a lot, uh, but the dinosaurs um, are definitely grouping together with a little smattering of the rep classic reptiles. Um, now what's interesting about this that ties very directly to some things that have already been stated is that that main network there, the reason why the dinosaurs are so well connected amongst <laughs> themselves is that they developed during the time of Pangaea, the supercontinent. So it was relatively easy, as things go, for these organisms to travel across a, a great landmass and be found in many different places. Now, we can actually contrast this to another group that should be near and dear to everyone's hearts, uh, the primates. Um, and so uh, we can actually look again here. This is a much less sort of central, uh, going back to something we'll learn a little more about in a couple of slides. Uh, but we have, a, a, again, a lot of small networks here. Now, there are reasons for this. So actually, over here in the corner, this is our genus. Um, and there's a whole grouping on this sort of little sub-network. And that's actually South Africa right there, or Southern Africa. Um, now, we can see some other interesting groups. This is the New World monkeys in South America. Uh, we've got a little tight-knit group of the protosimians and such, the lemurs. Uh, in Madagascar. We have some groups from Southeast Asia. And then this sort of big honking one here is the Old World, or really the Eurasian uh, groups, which also, oddly enough, include North America, though we would not normally think of that as Old World. Um, now, what's interesting about this is this is, you know, primates uh, developed much later. The uh, continents were much more separated at much greater distances. So again, uh, we see these smaller uh, patterns here that have something to do with the, the evolutionary track of the paleogeography. Now, we can look at this also in some other manners uh, through uh, some other interesting visualization techniques. So um, I'm going to show you a sunburst diagram here on the left, um, sort of uh, like a very advanced pie chart. And so here we have here we have this. So this is from the uh, paleobiology database, but basically one of the world's largest databases of both fossil and living organisms kind of all put into one. And we can actually look at total numbers of organisms um, within the fossil record. And so this is kind of, kind of interesting. So, um, so let's start off. Uh, in all of the fossil record, uh, chordata, so everything with a backbone, is just a little over 16%, which seems like a, like a really cool amount until you like go over to the mollusks, we, we, might, we might be outnumbered by clams, um, so, which is almost 40% of everything in the fossil record. So a um, lot of shelled things there. But we can, we can go into subsets. So like, for instance, we have mammals. They make a, almost 10% of everything in the fossil record. We can even go further into a little group, uh, carnivora, which you might be familiar with because that houses our canines, which are only 0.28% and our felines, which are even less, 0.15%. Uh, so some interesting uh, numbers there. Let me go back to our chart. Now, you can that's just a total number. We can actually look at intergroupings, so those connections, those networks, um, in, a, in a chord diagram where each of these strings 
is organisms that are found together. So uh, one organism it likely is found with many things, so there are many different cords that connect them. And actually, for more on that, I'm going to hand this back to Bob. Thanks. Fantastic. So cord diagrams are one way that you can look at minerals in the same way. This is a group of cobalt minerals, the commonest cobalt minerals. Each of these arcs represents a different cobalt mineral species. The length of the arc represents how common or rare that particular mineral is. And what we see here is something very, very striking to me when I started examining this. That is the three largest links, cobaltite, one of the major ores of cobalt, and scutarudite, the second major one. Those are very large primary minerals. They weather to form erythrite, and sure enough, you see this large band here going from cobaltite to erythrite, from scutarudite to erythrite. And so most of the erythrite specimens we find, it turns out, are the consequence of the weathering of these two minerals. I didn't know that. I don't think anyone's ever demonstrated that. Here's a way of seeing that visually. And many, many other trends, too, about what coexists with what, what doesn't kinds of visual information you simply cannot process with the human brain until you see it in this path. But what to me is most exciting is actually doing networks for minerals. In this case, each node is a mineral species. Each link is two minerals that coexist with each other. You make a mineral network in this way. And so this allows us then to generate patterns, visual patterns of all the minerals that coexist. It's amazing how this can work. There are, this is a rigorous formalism, so I want to do four things. I want to first of all show you briefly the nature of the data that we're using to generate these diagrams. I want to give you some examples of networks and how we can use them to make discoveries. Very briefly talk about the way we can use metrics, that is quantitative aspects of networks, to compare and contrast different elements, different groups of minerals. And finally, the most amazing thing at all, the force-directed graphs that we've been exploring that I think just open up an entire new world of discovery in mineralogy. Again, you've called out some elements that will be making the force-directed graphs of these, and we'll all be seeing it for the very first time. No one's ever seen those for those elements before. So this is really exciting for me. I, I'm, I'm sort of like on the edge of my seat wanting to see what Chow is generating right now. Okay, so what we do is we go back to classic textbooks. This is a four-volume massive set by Johansson in which he has 5,000 rocks described. A rock is a group of coexisting minerals. So you basically have tables like this where each vertical row is a set of minerals that coexist in a rock from a locality. I've gone in and by hand taken 729 characteristic rocks, made this very large spreadsheet, 729 rows, each representing a rock, 51 different minerals that are common minerals in rocks, a one means that the mineral is present in that particular rock, and you have a series of coexisting ones. Using this, we can generate networks. We can also use that MinDAT data. This is an incredible resource to us because it tells us all the minerals that coexist at a locality. Again, that's exactly what you need to make a network. So here's a very simple network that we made early on. It has 37 common rock-forming minerals in igneous rocks. These are rocks that cooled from a melt, from a lava, and formed a set of minerals that coexist. So it means that any common rock type has to be interconnected group of minerals. Here's a granite. There's a very different rock called olivine basalt. There's nepheline cyanide. And here you see there's some overlapping minerals in these two rock types. Now, the thing that's amazing to me is this diagram, as simple as it is, embeds all of igneous petrology. Everything about igneous rocks is here. And let me show you this more. We can do different renderings. Here is a three-dimensional, what's called a multi-dimensional scaling. Again, we have different minerals represented. We didn't draw all the lines here just because it gets too messy. But So two minerals that are close together, like quartz and topaz, exist commonly together. But two things that are far apart, like nepheline and quartz, never occur together. So you can use a diagram like this to understand what's going on. Because it's three-dimensional, you can rotate this, which is really fun to see. Go There it is. And so this starts giving us the relationships amongst these different points. And that's cool. That's sort of fun to look at. It's actually easier to analyze this when you do it in a two-dimensional projection. 
And here we can start thinking about the interrelationships of these minerals. Each of these dots is a different common mineral in igneous rocks. I mentioned Norman Bowen, a hero to me. A hundred years ago, he was working at the Geophysical Laboratory and developed his ideas about the evolution of igneous rocks. And one of his most important ideas is the Bowen reaction series that involves going from high temperature to a cooling melt to lower and lower temperatures. And as you do, you have a sequence of minerals. You have a plagioclase trend going from calcium-rich to sodium-rich minerals. You have a mafic trend going from olivine to pyroxene, hornblende to biotite. And then a late stage at cooler temperatures where you go feldspar, muscovite, quartz. That's well known to everyone who's taken petrology or introductory geology of this sort. And lo and behold, in this diagram, that trend is preserved. There's the plagioclase trend, there's the mafic trend, there's the late stage trend. That's Bowen's reaction series embedded in the two-dimensional projection. And of course, you can take this to many, many higher dimensions and see much more subtleties mathematically as you go to higher dimensions. In geology, we often look at phase diagrams to understand why certain minerals coexist. Here's a classic ternary diagram showing quartz, forsterite, anorthite, and the mineral enstatite in the middle. And you can think of this as a kind of mini network of things that coexist with each other. Lo and behold, in our network diagrams, the phase relations are embedded. Indeed, they must be. All phase relations in igneous petrology are embedded in this diagram. Now, we understand igneous rocks really well, but we can make a network diagram for any group of minerals. And most of those, no one has ever studied the phase relations. We simply don't know what they are. We can extract the phase relations from these diagrams. That's an incredible opportunity. OK, let's talk about metrics very quickly. And these are very intuitive. If you think about how people interact or how any sort of network would work, we're going to talk about density, centrality, and diameter. Density is just simply how many of the possible links are present. Very low density here, higher density here. If I added links, you could get higher and higher till when every single link is present, the density becomes one. We'll see networks of high density and low density in a minute. Here's centrality. When you have one node that's connected to everything else, that's high centrality. When you have several nodes, not one central player, but several nodes play roles, the centrality is lower. And finally, this idea of diameter, which really can be thought of as degrees of separation. You've heard the expression, six degrees of separation, that every human being is connected to every other human being on the planet by only six contacts. Well, here's an example of two networks. Each have nine nodes and 10 links. In this case, the diameter is two, but in this case, the diameter is five. Just a different rearrangement. So we can compare and contrast. And again, with minerals, this becomes an important distinction. So now let's look again at more detail at that force-directed graph of igneous rocks. In this case, the size of these circles, the nodes, indicates how abundant the mineral are. So we have common and rare minerals. The spacing indicates how frequently the two minerals occur together. The colors correspond, in this case, to mineral groups, quartz and feldspars in red, feldspathoids in orange. They're always separated from each other because they don't co-occur. And so here's this network. We see it's very high density. It also is low centrality because there's no one node that links solely to the others. By the way, this is a force diagram. It really is a dynamic diagram, as you'll see in a second, where every link has an equilibrium distance. But because of all the other nodes, you're pulled and you're stretched and you're contorted. And so forces, think of it as a whole bunch of springs that are interconnected that have to find an equilibrium spacing. That's what we're dealing with. And what that means is you can take a diagram like this and you can play with it. And I mean play. We do this for hours. This is so much fun. Take quartz, pull it to the side. See how it distorts the diagram. But it's on this side. Nephilim, which never occurs with quartz, is at the top side of the diagram. We go to the middle, there's magnetite connected to everything. Magnetite occurs in all kinds of igneous rocks. So it goes right back to the center, as does biotite, the black mica, which is also connected to all sorts of things. That's amazing. You can spend hours studying this. In the amount of information embedded in a diagram like this, 
with dynamics is incredible. And we can flip this, we can look at, let's just look at the minerals that occur in one kind of rock. Let's just look at the minerals that occur during one age period or have some other property. We can look at subsets and study this for hours and hours, for days. I think for probably for the next 10 years of our lives. Here's copper. This is Sean Morrison's work, 243 commonest copper minerals. And here we see a network. It's less dense. It's got more outliers. It has greater centrality because it has a few major central players that are linked to lots of other things. We find here that the colors now correspond to mineral chemistry. And look at the groupings here. This was a surprise to us. We, we had no idea we were going to see this. But you find that all the sulfides in red are sort of grouped up here. In blue, these are the oxides, the silicates, the carbonates that don't have sulfur. Over here in orange, these are sulfates with sulfur and oxygen. And so we see the segregation. We see this kind of amazing pattern, something no one's ever seen before. And you certainly wouldn't be able to do that looking at lists of hundreds and hundreds of copper minerals. Visually, we can see it immediately. And when I show you this, this is, I just think these are so beautiful. Uh, calcopyrite, the commonest ore of copper, linked to almost everything. It distorts the whole network when you pull it to the side. There's malachite, that's the beautiful green copper carbonate that's used in ornamental stone and, and some jewelry. It also is linked to many things, but it's on the lower half. Now look at this. this, this to me is really intriguing. When you pull copper out, I'm gonna pause it there. Notice the others were linked to everything. Copper though, it's focused down here. It's linked primarily to the sulfates and the oxides, but not to the sulfides. That's a shock to me. I, I had no idea. I thought that copper could very commonly occur with the sulfide minerals, but it seems like it avoids them. I don't understand that. We have we've never seen this written up. We have to understand it. There are going to be thousands of discoveries like this as we start exploring networks. And then, Chaliou's work on chromium, a completely different network for reasons I think we can start to understand. But you see here's a network that is extremely low density. It has much greater centrality because there's one dominant mineral, chromite. It has a very high diameter. In fact, it's six degrees of separation, literally, in this diagram. And in this case, we've colored this by the mode of formation. It turns out the chromium minerals form in all different ways. They form through igneous processes from a melt, in blue, there are metamorphic processes where you use temperature and pressure to alter the chromium minerals that occurred before. There's weathering products. There's soil minerals shown in tan here. They're very, very isolated from each other. It's fascinating why that is. And when you look at the way this behaves, there's chromite, and it just completely dominates this network. Everything follows it. Everything moves around. And when you, you can do this by, I mean, this is really a lot of fun <laughs> to play these games. There's another fairly abundant chromium mineral, crocoite. It's a weathering product. Notice it only it seems to be linked, at least primarily, to other weathering minerals. So we have this kind of thing. And you can explore every one of these nodes in the same way, spending hours doing it. So much to learn. OK. So now, what did we find? All right. So I want to share with you guys a pretty cool thing. We keep talking about how how new everything is, and um, this is very new. So this we're on mindat.org right now, but if you'll notice, we all, we're on the development server. So we're not actually live with this yet. We hope to be in the next upcoming months, um, but this is something that was made less than a month ago. Um, so here, someone called out uh, mercury. So this is literally the first time we've seen the mercury network diagram. This is the first time I've seen it. Um, so here I'm going to assume that this is cinnabar, and uh, these are colored by chemistry. Uh, we'll eventually have a legend up there when we, when we finalize this a little bit more. But you can see as I move cinnabar around, the most common um, mercury mineral, that everything is moving around with it. It's trying to find its equilibrium state, its lowest energy state. So that's what Bob was talking about with the, with the force-directed diagram. So that's what we're looking at here. And I believe, let's see, someone else called out. Do we have one here? All right, so this is silver. 
this is silver. And you see, this is this is trying to reach its equilibrium state and is sort of trying to nestle in there and it's having a little bit of a little bit of trouble getting in there. What's that big node? I'm guessing that's probably native Native silver. Silver would be my oh, would be my guess. So you can see this is a pretty this is a pretty connected network. It doesn't want me to grab it. It won't let me grab it. But um, <laughs> this is a pretty dense, densely connected network. Although you see, we do have some um, some loners out here on the edges. Yeah, it won't let me grab it. Unfortunately, you guys picked a strange one. I don't know what's going on with this. Again, these, these are the first time that we've we've seen these. Amazing. Yeah. So the colors here correspond to different <clears throat> chemical groups of minerals. The trouble is that it changes the color scheme every time you see a diagram and so having just seen this it's a little I, I assume that the blue is probably sulfides and sulfa salts but probably. I don't know what so that would be a native metal or, or a, um, an alloy so that probably is silver because it's a different color but I don't know what the greens are and we'll have to explore this more but it's really pretty amazing. Did we want to do another? Do you sure, guys want to one see more. actually I want put to see them one. in? Okay one so what, which one do we want to do? So this is on the fly, so none of us have ever seen this before. Let's try. Why don't we try trim? So I'd like to see it. Okay. Never seen it. Let's see. So this takes a few minutes. I uh, there aren't a ton of yttrium minerals, so hopefully it'll go quickly. Um, like Bob said, if we were to do more than a hundred in general, it can it can uh, be kind of slow. Wow, it's pretty. Yeah. See, it's trying to find an equilibrium mm -hmm. state. Takes a while. And you can see this being so multicolored, there's a lot of variable composition here. So you're transforming with a lot of different uh, anions. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. So this this is this is a whole PhD thesis worth of exploration right here, just to give you a sense. And we've all seen it here for the very first time. No one's ever looked at yttrium before. Mm -hmm. So thank you. That's really exciting. I mean, it's just like <sighs> I'm like <laughs> I want to go back and <laughs> where I'm start. Writing. Okay, so you see with mineral network analysis, it's an incredibly powerful tool. Um, these different networks reveal aspects of, of chemistry and of the modes of formation. I mean, there's just so much to discover. We're just at the beginning of this, the literal beginning of this whole field. And this whole idea of big data mineralogy, to me, is tremendously exciting. The fact that we now have the data resources, they're growing, they have this exceptional idea for, for discovery. We have mineral evolution, we have mineral ecology, we have network analysis. They all just exemplify what is the very beginning of a new mineralogy. You know, I think mineralogy is known very, very long as an observational science. We go out in the field, you find something in the ground, you pick it up, you identify it, you take it back to the lab. And that's how you discover things. We're now at a place where we can make predictions. For the first time ever, mineralogy becomes a predictive science. And I just can't tell you how much fun it is. So thank you very much. I hope there's time for questions. Thank you, Bob. Um, so I will handle your questions. Thank you. Um, questions. You first. Could you explain what these mysterious coordinates are? Which were there? You had all these things wrapped the coordinates, but yes. I couldn't figure out what. Uh, Yes, this is one of the, the things that's hard to get around. In, a, in any network, so imagine a social network, there's really no axes. It's just kind of relative. The distances correspond to frequency of interaction. And so you basically come up with some fictive distance. So it's not meters, it's not inches, it's just frequency related numbers. It's dimensionless, essentially. So. We don't need to have dimensions on this because basically it's the relative spacing of everything. We can scale it up, we can scale it down, and it gives us the same information. But it's a really wonderful question because, you know, as scientists, we're always thinking about units. What are the units? What, and if you're making measurements, you think there have to be units. Yes? Bob has been yelled at for trying to add dimensions. <laughs> yeah. The RPI people tell me I'm not supposed to do that. So there's a question over here. Here's a microphone. I was, a, I was attracted by the ante at the front of antinomy, so I googled the origin of the word. It means against monks. <laughs> Evidently a bunch of monks were poisoned by stimulants. Oh. <laughs> that's, that's the origin of the... 
That's great. Well, you know, we can do poisons <laughs> on this, I'm sure. See, there's a question right here, and then, there's, then you next. Can these networks tell you where to go look for your missing minerals? I think the networks can tell us a huge amount about where to go and what to look for. Because we can, for example, say, well, this particular mineral is really valuable. Now let's look at subsets of all the different minerals. What's the age of the deposits that have that mineral? What are the locations? What's the tectonic setting? What are the coexisting minerals? Can we, where do we find those conditions? We can use our database to say we find X, Y, Z there. Let's go there. Maybe we've missed this deposit. And so I think that's really an incredibly exciting thing. You can do the same thing with paleobiology. Every time you find species X, you find species Y, except for this place. If we go there, I predict we're going to find species Y. So that's exactly, that's big data allows you to ask these questions. So at the lecture that was given here last month in October, we learned that uh, the Earth's crust is constantly being pushed down into the mantle. And that since the inception of the Earth, really almost all of the crust has been recycled. So how does that impact the reliability of your data on minerals going back in time? Our mineral evolution studies, we are paranoid about this question of mineralization being episodic versus erosion being episodic. So are we seeing minerals because they formed only in this time period, or are we seeing gaps because those have all been eroded away? We really think about that. Now in terms of continents, when you say most of the crust has disappeared, that's the oceanic crust, the thin crust that subducts. The continents, the masses on top, they pretty much stay, they gradually erode, but we have very, very ancient terrains, for example, in Australia and South Africa and Greenland, rocks that are almost four billion years old. So those are places where we can go and look and find what minerals might have occurred early in Earth's history. Uh, can you speculate on what uh, <clears throat> these diagrams might look like on, uh, say, something like a moon of Jupiter like Io? Oh, that is such a great question. We have, we are just itching to start a project <laughs> on looking at meteorites and uh, Sean is one of the uh, program scientists for Curiosity studying the mineralogy of Mars. So what's the mineralogy of Mars? What's the mineralogy of the Moon? Let's look at the meteorites that come from the asteroid Vesta. They're called HED meteorites. And we have that information. And compare all of these see what we can find. Now, Io is a really interesting case. This is a sulfur-rich world. It has chemistry that's quite different from Earth. It would be fascinating to know more about it. I don't know how much data we have right now and how much speculating we can do, but that's exactly the kind of question that excites us right now. And you can imagine a network for, for Io versus a network for Moon or Earth. That's really a neat thing to be able to do. Uh, yeah, uh, you uh, speak about uh, finding the dates of everything, your criteria for dating, is that fairly consistent? And do those criteria change? I'm sure they do change over time. I was wondering if, that's, if those discoveries are more or less frequent or episodic or whatever. Oh, you raise such a great point. We have had hours and hours and hours of discussion about how do we define an age? How do we find a locality? Imagine you have a place where there was a mineral deposit formed by a vein. You have the host rock, which is, say, 1.5 billion years old. The vein was in place 1.2 billion years old. Then it was exposed to various kinds of groundwater uh, 900 million years ago. It had a heating episode 600 million years ago. Then it was exposed at the surface and started oxidizing 50 million years old. What's the age? Each mineral has a different age, and we have to sort that out and figure that out. So. Thank, I, I wish Josh Golden were here so I could you know, just shake his hand and thank him and have you all applaud for him, because he's the guy that's been dealing with this. And 120,000 mineral locality age data he has entered by hand so far. And each one of those involves going to the primary literature and reading it and figuring out which mineral came first and which came later. It, it's a mammoth, awesome job. So thank you, Josh. I think we'll take one more question. So. Uh, have you had a chance yet to compare the evolution of various types of networks as you go through it? So, for example, 
<laughs> we were just talking about that today. We are so excited. Yeah. It would seem to me that that uh, you would have characteristics for different time periods. That would be the same you can imagine these networks they were showing, and you start with the minerals that only occurred three or four billion years ago, and then build the network. Watch it grow. Watch it change. Some minerals will go extinct. Others will come in new places. The network will form new links. It'll have new kinds of deposits. When oxygen comes in, you'll see the explosion of the network. And that can all be visualized. And we were just talking today about doing that for paleobiology and doing it for mineralogy. So, so you know, our, we're, you want to join our group? <laughs> we need more people. We need more hands. I would like to thank Bob Hayes. And Chow. Chow and Shauna and Mike. I couldn't have done it without them, believe me. I could not. There he is, ciao. Yeah, <laughs> there he is. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.